Uh, our speaker is Chris Bound, uh, who is the co-founder and chief statistician at uh, Social Media Research Bureau, which is a cloud-based media analytics startup focused on the development of cross-channel analytics software to measure and monetize social messages return on engagement, or ROE. He is also a statistician at Metadata Solutions, a global leader in providing software as a service based clinical technology solutions that enhance the efficiency of and lower the cost of clinical development. His previous experience includes development of statistical models and cross-channel analytics reporting for Nutrisystem. <coughs> At Nutrisystem, Chris developed the fully integrated marketing analytics solution that linked website, call center, and customer data to measure and monetize the media spend impact on business outcomes. Chris is one of us, he's a Villanova alum from the other side of campus, the College of Arts and Sciences, where he received his MS in Applied Stat, and he also holds a BS in Math. The title of Chris's talk is The Promise of Social Media Analytics. Please give a warm Villanova welcome. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Um, now I don't have to do the whole intro that I was planning on doing because he just did it for me. <laughs> do you remember anything he said? sound a little boring, kind of a nerd. Basically, that's the gist, right? So um, I got my MS here in Applied Statistics a couple years ago. Um, from there, I actually taught high school math for a few years. Let me give you the boring stuff first, and then we'll get into the cool stuff back here. Uh, so I taught high school math for a couple of years, uh, and then I went into business analytics at Nutrisystem uh, for a few years as well. And now I currently hold a position as statistician at a pharmaceutical company in Conshohocken. So I work there. Um, in my free time, which I have so much of, uh, I, cr I am a co-founder of actually two companies, one called Bound Analytics and the other one called Social Media Research Bureau, one that I'm actually um, transitioning most of my Bound Analytics work into. So this will be, this will be the, uh, the main primary focus of my work going forward. Um, our main goal really at Social Media Research Bureau is to take companies to take brands into the next wave of marketing strategy, into the new era of how to um, contact and to excite the consumer. Um, th there is a new wave going on in case, you, in case everybody, uh, well, let, let me show you an example. Uh, how many people in here have a TV? If everybody's not raising their hand, you're lying. <laughs> how many people in here, and this might be a different one, how many people in here have DVR or TiVo? Okay. How many people, when they're watching a DVR program, skip the commercials? That's what you have it for, right? Good. How many people actually sit down and read the newspaper anymore? There's, there's, there's going to be a few, and I bet you that's the, the older generation. No offense. Um, so uh, actually, the newspaper company has, has seen a 44% decrease in ad revenue from the past four years. That's, four, uh, that's $24 billion decrease in ad revenue from the newspapers. So as you can see, it's, it's sort of, I don't want to say dying out, but it's definitely, uh, it's definitely not the, where it was a, a few years ago. Um, how many people get the mail? Uh, everybody, again, gets the mail. When you get your mail, what do you do with it? You split it into two piles, right? One pile is your bills and your personal letters from people that you know. The other pile is crap. You throw it out. You don't even look at it. Sometimes you do, but mostly you don't. What do you think is in that pile? Advertisements. It's people trying to sell you something. So if you're not watching the TV ads, you're not reading the newspaper, you're not opening the mail, how do you know about products that are currently on the market. Anybody? Let's be interactive. Let's, let's get this going. Let's talk. Word of mouth. Word of mouth. That's a good one. But word of mouth, more like where you, wh whose mouth? <laughs> Your friends at, at school? For the most part, where do you go? Does anybody heard of the internet? <laughs> the internet, right? Has anybody ever been on the internet before? <laughs> Everybody's going to raise their hands again, right? So the internet, the new wave of how to market to people. Um, I had one more question for you. Uh, so when you're, when you're uh, researching products on the internet, what do you do? Has anybody read a product review on the internet? Yeah, you're reading the product reviews. You're, you're actively going out and, and researching your own products and, and consumer um, ideas of what you want. Has anybody ever purchased online? You're purchasing online as well, right? The days of, of uh, having to wait to go to the store are, are, are coming to an end, and you can buy everything you want online now. How many people in here have a Facebook account? <laughs> How many people were on Facebook today? 
you see the promise of social media analytics. You see the new wave of marketing just right here in this room. <coughs> there, there's a new wave coming and it's social media analytics and it's no longer the consumer doesn't want to be found, the consumer will find you. They don't want to be targeted with 100 different ads, they're not going to look at them. It's a waste of money. They're going to actively research your brand, your company. They're going to talk with their friends word of mouth. They're going to look online and, 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 re, and at reviews and Facebook and Twitter and, and, and social media spaces. And then they're going to decide that you're the product for them, not the other way around. It is definitely a new way of, of, of thinking. So with that, let's get into the presentation of the promise of social media analytics. Uh, I'm going to take questions afterwards, uh, so please, if, if you have a question, maybe you know, keep note of it, write it down, and, and let me know afterwards, and I'll, I'll try to get to as many as I can. So I just gave you, um, you know, we just did our own little survey here about some of the facts of usage of social media. Let me give you some more. If I'm looking backwards a lot, it's because they're behind me. So here are some of the usage facts in social media. These are fascinating. I didn't know this until a couple months ago when I started this business. Dr. Liberatore? <laughs> nope. There we go. Okay. So, first fact. In 2005, only 14% of people under the age of 40 were, were actively using social media. By 2010, that number was 75%. And that was in 2010. We're now in 2012. That number has grown to up, up, upwards of 85% of people are now using social media sites. Years to reach 50 million users. Back in the day, there was radio. It took 38 years. <laughs> TV, 13 years. Internet took four years. Facebook took three. Three years. In the next four years, Facebook would add 700 million more. And that's where we are today. 750 million people have an active account on Facebook. By the end of this year, that's going to grow to a billion. Half of the Internet population is going to be on Facebook. One billion people. Currently on Twitter, over 200 million tweets per day are happening right now. People are talking about things right now as we speak. Maybe you're tweeting right now. I don't know. You could be. That would be kind of cool. Um, this number was actually 140 million in March. I had an original slide here that said 140 million. I did some more research a couple days ago. Since March, it's grown to 200 million on average per day. That's 2,200 tweets per second. YouTube generates 800 million unique user visits each month. People are on these sites and they're looking at content. They're actively engaged in social media. Whether you like it or not, whether you're on the train or you're not, this is what's happening and this is the new wave of, of marketing and consumer <coughs> analytics. So again, you see the promise of social media analytics and what it currently is doing, the present, and what it can do in the future I'm hoping to show you today. Let's look at the agenda. Okay, so first, first things first. What is structured data? What is unstructured data? Most of what you see on social media is considered unstructured data, and most people don't know how to handle that. So we're going to talk a little bit about structured versus unstructured data. Secondly, I took uh, a little bit of time over the past couple of months, and I organized some uh, social spotlight on the Villanova Wildcats men's basketball team. Um, I pulled down some uh, social media data from Twitter and Facebook and blogs and forums. We can take a look at something that hopefully relates to you guys uh, with, the, with the Villanova men's basketball team. And then I want to talk about an industry example. Um, so how does it relate to business? How, do, how can we use these analytics and these statistics to, to better optimize or make more efficient our business? And then finally, I'll talk, you know, I'll give you the grand pitch, the grand pitch of Social Media Research Bureau and the future of marketing analytics and the future of marketing mix. Uh, I hope to get through all four of these in somewhere around 40 minutes because we have a hard stop here at 2.30. But so if I'm rushing, it's not because I'm nervous or anything. It's because I have to get out of here at 2.30, and so do you guys. We have another presentation coming in right afterwards. So structured data. What is structured data? Structured data is what everybody wants to have. Any analyst, any statistician, anybody working with data tables is going to want to have the data in a structured format. It's basically data in a table. It's data that's organized into columns and rows like in an Excel sheet. Everybody's seen data in an Excel sheet before. Here's an example of, of what a data warehouse may look like in a company, for example. So structured, right? You have an order table down here. Orders, you have your order ID, you have the customer ID, the employee ID, um, you have the dates, you have the shipment dates, you have the addresses, you have all the information about the order in this table. And it relates, that's a key word, these are relational data tables that relates over to this order detail 
table, which houses information about the order. So you, you link on order ID, and you have your product ID, you have your price, you have how many, and you have any coupons that, that happen there as well. From here, it can link up here by product ID. It joins to product, and you can get the product name, who supplied it, what category is it in. And then finally, you can go over to the category, and you can see a description of the product. You can get the name of the product, and maybe a picture. It's organized. If I was to mine this, I could easily go into this table and bring it into a SaaS program or some analytics application and, and go to back to the, to the executive and tell them how well they're doing based on um, you know, shipments and based on timing and based on price and average order price and things like that. It's the holy grail of data mining is structured data. Well, guess what? Social media is not structured data. It's very unstructured data. It's scrambled. It's all over, it's not, I, I shouldn't say all over the place, but it's not in a format in which you can easily access information. Yes, you can read a review, right? Everybody can read one review, but can you read 10,000 reviews? Probably not. Here's an example of some unstructured data, and this is a, a website called collegeprowler.com. And what you see here are two reviews uh, about Villanova. What you'll notice is that there is a ton of information here, but it's unstructured. For example, you have the school, school ID, school. You have the topic, academics. You have the ID, the user ID. You have the year in which they're going to graduate. You have um, the major, the title, the rating. You have the rating of the, of the comment itself, and you have the date. All that information can be put into a structured database, columns for each of those att attributes. Not to mention all of the information that's in here. Information like um, uh, class size, you have information about learning resources, you have information about workload. All of these pieces of information can be structured, but how do we do that? It's, I mean, I can read this and get the information I want out of it, but I can't read hundreds or thousands of these at a time. I have to have it in a structured format. So how do we get there? What's the question? So uh, unstructured data, what is it? It's text heavy. It's most of the things you'll see on social media. I'll switch over here now because I feel like I'm neglecting this side of the room. So it's text heavy. There's no predefined data model. It does not fit into relational data tables. There's no joining as we were talking about before. And according to a source, um, a Wikipedia source that I have marked here, 80% of companies or businesses, 80% of their data is unstructured. Emails. How many emails do you send a day? That's all unstructured data. How many tweets or how many Facebook posts do you, put, do you post a day? That's all unstructured. And so ex examples of unstructured data are email, Word docs, audio, video files like YouTube, uh, blogs, Facebook, and Twitter. The main question is, how do we turn that scrambled mess into something we can use? And I'm, I'm hoping to show you guys how, how today. There's the answer. That was my segue into the answer, and I missed it. I missed the key. So social media analytics is the answer to that question. Again, let's go back to the agenda. The next part of the talk today is going to be a social spotlight on Villanova Wildcats men's basketball. What I was able to do was take information from Twitter, from Facebook, from blogs, from forums, starting in November, the beginning of the season, till the end of the year in December, uh, aggregate it all and, and take a look at uh, what some of the things people are saying. I was also able to pull information for some competitors as well, so Pittsburgh Panthers basketball team and for UConn as well, some of the Big East rivals. Okay, so let's take a look at how those three interact on the social media space. The first thing I like to do, and this is a really cool way to, to, um, to view what's being said, is it's called a word cloud. What a word cloud is, these are the most used terms for those three teams, I'm sorry, for Villanova between November and December. These terms are, are what's being said the most often. The bigger terms are the ones that are being said the most the smaller terms are said less often. But you'll see some interesting things here. I think you'll see um, Missouri is a big name. Anybody know, have an idea as to why Missouri might be talked about a lot? Does anybody follow college basketball at all? <laughs> well, does anybody know what that is? They played at Madison Square Garden in the Jimmy V Classic. It was a big game. <laughs> it was a big game. I think they lost, but it still it raised a lot of social media chatter because it was played at Madison Square Garden. It was a Jimmy V Classic. It was a big game. Um, you also see like the Big East is in there. You have Wildcats. You have Temple. Um, I think Jay Wright's name is in there somewhere. There, there he is. Um, Peretta. Anybody know who Harry Peretta is? Women's coach, he's in there as well. So these are the words that are being most used. All right, this is the first step in text mining and analytics for social media. Take a look at what's being said. Can we figure out any topics based on this? Well, we just did. We figured out a few, actually. 
And then from there, let's go to the next step. The next step is taking a look at these three teams over time, from November to December. Okay, so what you see here are three line charts, the blue being Villanova Wildcats social media chatter for the two months by day. The red line is the Pittsburgh Panthers. The green line is the Yukon Huskies. Anybody see anything right away that, that would be interesting for someone to know about social media? If you're a Villanova fan, you're the lowest talked about team. No offense. I love Villanova. I do. But UConn is a, is a giant school and, and Pittsburgh as well. So um, you can see that the, the social media chatter is lowest for Villanova, uh, uh, eclipsed a bit by Pittsburgh, and then also eclipsed by UConn. Let's take a look at some of these spikes. All right, so the blue line remembers Villanova. Let's see what people are talking about during these spikes. First spike, Harry Preda gets his 600th win. That was a big milestone for him, so there was a lot of buzz about it. The next, Villanova played LaSalle. They won that game. But social media boards talked about it. Next is the first round of the 76 Classic Tournament. They were invited to play. Uh, I think they came in fourth out of eight, so not bad. Uh, here's that Missouri game at the Madison Square Garden. It's the biggest spike there for Villanova. And f you've got the Holy War versus St. Joe's. I think they lost that game too. Not the best season, but we all still love them, right? And then they played West Virginia. Um, they lost that as well, I think. But they're being talked about, okay? There's, so there's a social media buzz happening uh, about the team. Let's take a look at Pittsburgh. You see right away a few bigger spikes. First one, they were upset at home by Long Beach State. So not all chatter is good chatter, guys. You have to remember. It may look like they're winning the war in social media chatter, but that, that's, negative, that's negative emotion happening about Pittsburgh Panther team. How about this? They lost to Wagner, another big spike. And then they lost to Notre Dame. All right, so just because they're winning in volume doesn't mean they're winning in emotion or sentiment. Okay? Let's take a look at the Yukon Huskies. Their first big spike, again, was a big upset loss to UFC Athletics, a game they should have never lost, and they did at home. Husky versus Harvard, that's a local, sort of a local um, rivalry going on, Huskies versus Harvard, so that was a big spike. And then guess what? Women's basketball. Women's basketball has the biggest spike on the board here. I didn't see the game, but apparently uh, Baylor versus UConn was a great women's basketball game. Ended, you know, dramatic fashion. Uh, did, anybody, did anybody see it? Yes. I have no idea, but I'm going to take your word for it. <laughs> so it was definitely uh, a big uh, social media trigger and uh, quite a game. Okay, so after we take a look at that, what else can we do? Well, obviously you guys saw this on the last slide. Share a voice. Out of those three teams, UConn's being talked about the most, 48% of the time. Pittsburgh's being talked about next, 33% of the time. And then Villanova, 18% of the time. But as you saw, a lot of the chatter about the other teams, and Villanova as well, it was negative in emotion. And the way we figure out emotion is you take a look at the words like love or hate, things that show something about the, uh, the social media chatter. You're not just looking at something that says, come watch the Villanova-Missouri game at uh, ESPN, the U, or whatever. Um, that, that shows no emotion. There's no sentiment in that. I love Villanova basketball. That's positive. I hate the way the team is playing right now. That's negative. So as you can see, that leads to the next slide, sentiment analysis. You take a look at Villanova, you take a look at Pitt, you take a look at UConn. So Villanova and UConn actually have a pretty decent positive sentiment. 70% are positive mentions and 72 for UConn are positive mentions. Pittsburgh, however, has sort of a uh, not as good emotional sentiment analysis. The, uh, the Pittsburgh Panthers have a 62% positive versus a 38% negative. Um, which is quite big compared to the other two schools. And I think that's due to all the upsets that, that, that they had in the, the past couple of months. People were fuming about how bad they were playing. So far, so good. Everybody good? You're asking yourself, I hope you're asking yourself, people in here that are business people, <laughs> what does this mean? Who cares, right? Who cares about Villanova Wildcats? Yeah, it's great. It's cool. I like it. Um, it's interesting to me, but can I use it? How do I use it? Well. Let me give you a recent stat that Dr. Posner actually gave to me um, a couple days ago. Um, there's a, a quote, a recent IBM CFO study shows that analytics-driven organizations had 33% more revenue growth, 12 times the EBITDA, which is earnings before ta interest, tax, depreci depreciation, and amortization, and 32% more return on capital invested. Any CFOs out there, any financial people out there, they'll be like, they, they do this. 
they would do this if they, if they heard those numbers. Those are great numbers. And just because you're using analytics, CFOs would, would give you a raise if you, if you showed that kind of performance um, in, in, a, in a company. Let me give you some more facts. Inbound marketing, which is social media, which is letting the customer find you instead of you actively engaging the customer in direct mail and TV and things like that. Letting the customer find you, guess what? It costs less. 62% uh, less per lead than traditional outbound marketing. That's huge. Millennials, I think most of you in here, possibly born late 80s, early 90s, somewhere around there, you're a millennial. You guys now outnumber, I think I am too. No, maybe not. Gen Y. <laughs> millennials currently outnumber baby boomers. Who's the consumer nowadays? It's the millennials. Who's the future of business? It's the millennials. Guess what? You guys all are on social media. 96% have joined the social media site. Almost 100% of millennials, the future of, cons of consumers, the future of business, are all using social media. 64% of Facebook users have liked a brand. 78.6% of consumers have joined a company's community to get more information. And 71% of those people are more likely to purchase from that, from that company as well. 90% of consumers trust product reviews and peer recommendations. So when you're actively engaged in researching a product, you read the review, you trust it. Much more than you trust an advertisement. Only 14% of people trust commercials, trust direct mail, trust print, trust email spam. It doesn't, it doesn't really do what it used to do. I mean, I'm not saying it's not efficient. It is efficient. It was efficient. But it needs to be integrated with social media. Companies that blog, this, this is a killer. Companies that blog have 97% more inbound links and 55% more website visitors. You know what people would do for 55% more website visitors? I don't want to get into weird stuff, but they'll do a lot. Those are, again, numbers that, that a marketing officer would just bow down to and, and give you a raise on the spot, I promise. So let's take a look at the industry, OK? Um, Let's take a look at a business example. Uh, how many people um, had a New Year's resolution this year? Come on. Come on. Was it to lose weight or to get to the gym? Like, was it to be a little bit more active? Maybe. Mine was. Um, this time of the year is a big year. For, there's a big time of the year for, for weight loss and for, and you guys heard my background from, with Nutrisystem. People's resolutions are to lose weight, to become more active. And you've probably seen a lot of commercials to that nature as well. What companies have you guys seen and out there with commercials right now? Anybody that you can think of? Nutrisystem. Anything else? Anybody else? Weight Watchers, right? One more. Jenny Craig. Nice. You guys got them. Right now, they're really, really active. And it's a very competitive market for those three, um, those three brands. I figured this would be a good time to, to talk about it because right now is the biggest time of their season, January and February, when everybody's hitting the gym, when everybody's trying to, to diet, everybody's doing a diet plan. These three companies are at their, each other's throats to try and figure out how to find the consumer and how to um, market to them. So let's take a look at these three on the social media boards. So in a competitive market, nowadays the voice of the consumer is knowledge. Knowledge is key. And here comes the cheese, guys. It's a little cheesy, I know. Marketers want to know the what. They want to know the when. They want to know the where. They want to know the how. And finally, they want to know who are these people. Right? So all these questions need to be answered by a marketing officer uh, or someone working in the marketing department. These are questions that you need to know in order to segment your population and to target consumers. Let's answer these questions through social media. What are they saying? Here's what they're saying. All right, here's some actual blurbs from social media sites. I split them into positive and I split them into negative. So you've got, on the positive side, things that you can understand about what they're saying is um, it's easy because it's portioned. It kind of tastes good. It's pretty tasty. Um, it's a good kickstart. It's, it's got a lot of initial weight loss, um, but it may not be a long-term solution. Negatively, the food sucks. It doesn't taste good. You see that all over the place. The food is just not, not good enough. There's not enough uh, variety. And finally, it's really expensive. I just can't afford it right now. All these things are, are, are good. Um, it's good knowledge for, uh, for a company to know. 
when are they saying it? Now we're going to get a little bit more complicated and a little bit more complex with the analysis. When are they saying it? So remember I told you that um, right now, January and February, this is last year, but January and February uh, are the most important time for a weight loss industry. Well, wouldn't you like to know, leading up to that, that you don't have any share of voice, for example, for Nutrisystem? Nutrisystem was non-existent in October and hardly there in December. When people are making decisions about what plan they're going to use in the new year, Nutrisystem is not even there. Yeah, they come on strong in January, but this time, December and January, by this time, people have already made the decision. So that's information that you want to know and you want to, to re uh, remedy as quickly as you could. And obviously, Weight Watchers is the king here. They've got a lot of social media action going on. Um, there's a, who's their biggest name now? Who is it? Oh, yeah, Barkley, there's a new one. And there's uh, Jennifer Hudson. Hudson. I think uh, Jenny just got Mariah Carey or something like that. I don't know. Where are they saying it? Imagine that you're a social media manager and you want to take a look at um, where I should target my, my, uh, my blogs or my posts or who I should be talking to. If you knew that community.babycenter.com was the top forum for all three, and it is for all three of those companies, and that you were getting your butt kicked 66% to 18 or to 16, you're going to want to get there and you're going to want to get there fast to steal back some share of voice, to do something. All right? Don't just sit there and, and let your company be overtaken by a, a specific forum or blog. You can guide conversation. You don't have to go after the consumer, but you can provide info, you can provide feedback, you can provide links, information, anything you can do to, to get people to your website and to get people talking about your brand. How are they saying it? Here's a mix of blogs, Facebook, forums, and Twitter. So for Nutrisystem, you've got about uh, almost 30% are in blogs, you know, a little bit under 10% in Facebook, over 40% in forums, and 20% in Twitter. That's bas the basic social mix that's going on right now. But you see something interesting in Weight Watchers in that, and remember, they are the king in social media as, as of this point. Over 60% of people talking about Weight Watchers are talking about them in forums. Why? Well, I'd have to look into that a little bit further, I think, as a, as a social media manager. Maybe that's somewhere I should be. Maybe they're doing something there that we're not doing. Let's take a look. And so, again, information that, that's, that could be useful. Who are they? This is, a big, this is a big question that people always try to answer. Who are my, who's my target audience? Who's talking about me? Are they saying good things? Are they saying bad things? Let me give you an example about, uh, for Twitter. This is a Twitter, um, Twitter metric here, so retweet. Does everybody know what a retweet is? I'm, I don't want to take it for granted that you do. You tweet something, someone sees it, likes it, and they tweet it again. Retweet. Okay? Uh, companies tweet information. They hope it goes viral, meaning that someone sees it, retweets it, retweets it again, and it, get, it goes into this whirlwind of viral activity, and everybody gets to see it. Um, in the past year, Nutrisystem has only had about 39 retweets. Jenny Craig has had over 100. Weight Watchers has had over 300 people retweeting information about Weight Watchers. One retweet is great. Ten retweets is amazing. Fifty retweets is pretty good. So another metric that you want to look at is how viral did those retweet? How viral did it go? And for Nutrisystem, uh, about 12% went viral. Uh, for Jenny, about 11%, and for Weight Watchers, uh, a little bit under 25%. So their, their tweets are going viral more often. Here's the cool part. You can actually see who these people are. So for Nutrisystem, the person tweeting the most about their brand is Easy Health 67273. It's not me, I promise. I would never name myself that. It's weird. I would do this, though. Billy Bonjour, that's pretty cool. Billy Bonjour is the top influencer for Jenny Craig. And you've got fit, not fat, 247 for <laughs> Weight Watchers. This is real data. This is public data. I didn't have to you know, hire anybody to get this. I got this off social media just because. And no, companies nowadays aren't even looking at this stuff. Well, some are. There are a lot. But they don't know how. They don't know what to do. And, and you can see right here that this is a, this is, these are important metrics uh, for a company to have when talking about their brand and competitive activity. All right, so the future of marketing mix. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the, uh, the current state of affairs, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how I see the future and how social media can integrate into that future, um, which I think is 
the new wave, and it's really important for companies to, to get on board with as soon as they can. What we just talked about, cheesy, what we just talked about is just the tip of the iceberg, all right? Again, publicly available data. I did not have to do anything. I did not have to contact Jenny Craig. I did not have to contact Weight Watchers. I simply crawled the boards, got the analytics, put them together, and presenting it to you now, okay? Tip of the iceberg. Imagine if a company had this information, what they could do with it, right? Imagine that you're Weight Watchers or Jenny Craig and that you now have all that information about social media and then you can integrate that with your website analytics. For example, how many people on my website are from Facebook? How many people are from Twitter? Is the conversion better for Facebook users than for Twitter users? Where's my target audience? People that blog have a higher retention rate or is it people that are on the forums? How can I optimize conversion? That's step one. So we're, we're going to build here, okay? Once you have that, then you can integrate this information into your call center operations. Think about knowing when something goes viral and knowing that the phones are going to ring before they start ringing and knowing what people are going to ask before they even ask it. That would be really helpful, I think, in a call center uh, to know what's, what's, what's about to happen. Um, and also optimizing conversion again. So if you're that well informed when people are on the phone with you, it's just going to be easier to land the sale. And then we're going to build further, right? So then you talk about your traditional marketing channels, the spend, the millions and millions of dollars you're spending on TV, on your print, on your direct mail. Well, imagine if you could find out without having to do massive testing, which companies do and should do a lot of testing, which ad resonated best with your consumer base. Social media will be, if there's a, an ad people like, they'll talk about it. If there's an ad people don't like, they're going to talk about it. If there's an ad that doesn't resonate at all, they won't. They won't talk about it, and, but you'll, at least you'll know. All right, so you can see how your ads are relating to the consumer base on the social media boards. And then finally, once you build this mix model, this marketing, new marketing mix model with traditional and social and website and e-com and call center, once you have that in place, you can then begin to understand how to increase new customers, how to keep them engaged, what they're talking about, what they want. Remember, nowadays it's what they want, not what you want. They want info. They want links. They want communities. They want discussion boards. And once you know all that, and once you know what their triggers are, you can increase new sales, you can increase retention, you can increase lifetime value, and just customer satisfaction. And that's the goal. Really, that's the goal nowadays. So this is what I see as the future of marketing analytics. Let me give you a better, another visual of what that looks like today, the current state of affairs. How am I doing on time? Great. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Cool. So the current state of affairs looks something like this. You've got your traditional marketing, right? We talked about it. You use it. You see it. It doesn't really do much for you. TV, newspapers, magazines, direct mail. You know, split it and throw it out. Email, email works, email's good. Um, these are good, these work. All right. They don't work as much as, as some of the other methods do, but they're tried and true, they're traditional. Every company that's marketing is going to have these, hopefully going to have these triggers, these channels, okay? You have your e-com portion. What's e-com? It's search engine optimization. You have a team working on getting your name to the top of the Google list. If I search weight loss, I want to see my brand first. How do you do that? Well, search engine optimization, keywords. You also have affiliate programs. So you have partners. You have other websites that are hawking your information so that they can get a piece, right? Um, a tried and true method that people use today. Your call center ops, we just talked about this, customer service. Knowing when the phone's going to ring, improving performance, improving retention, improving customer satisfaction. All things that are being done and being done well. Probably not as good as they could be because what I'm proposing the future is something like this. Isn't that cool? Oh, that was cool. I had fun with animations on this one. So integrating social media into every single aspect of your marketing and your customer strategy your whole customer uh, life cycle and the way that you interact is changing. 
And it's changing so that you now need to provide and not push. All right, information, like I said, um, community. No longer do people want to get ads shoved down their throat. And if they do, they're going to be turned off to your brand. It's as simple as that. Uh, over, oversaturation is a, big, is a big thing that's happening. People just don't care about that stupid commercial anymore. So it, social media needs to be integrated into that system. And what my company strives to do is integrate Facebook tweets. I missed that. So Facebook posts, you know, Twitter tweets, who the consumers are, blogs, and in the future, hopefully, YouTube as well. So there's programs out there like dictation apps that will actually take words and transform them into text. That's information. That's good stuff. That's the future. And that is my company. Social Media Research Bureau. See how that all comes together? Yeah, that's nice. So what we do is we measure social return on engagement. There's a, a big term that comes out, ROI, return on investment, and it's, it's one that we use as well. Um, but return on engagement is the new ROI, I think, and, and we're trying to pioneer that, and we're trying to develop that. Um, we're developing new algorithms to crawl the internet to get better feeds. We're developing new algorithms to, to structure the data um, there's, there's applications and, and software out there, um, but you know, we're, it's, it's still very early in, in, the, in this life cycle because as you saw in the stats, social media has only been around for maybe five years. Um, and we're, you know, we're also trying to integrate social media with internal KPIs. Companies don't, some companies do, I keep saying the word don't, but some do, not many. And any subscription-based social media software out there that you go look at, will they do not integrate with internal KPIs. That's where, this, that's where we're different, and that's where the, um, you saw the pyramid sort of build. That's where the, that's where the gold is, I think. Um, and with that, I think uh, my references, make sure I show them for you guys. Um, my contact info, and I'm willing to take any questions that you guys have, anything that you're, uh, you want to talk about. Yeah? Yeah, first question. How do you know what describes influence? So one of the ways that we look at influence is to take a look at how many people actually follow that person. So if, for example, if, you, if, if I tweet something and someone who has 10 friends or 10 followers retweets it, that's not much influence. But if they have 10,000 followers, that's a little bit more influence. And so everyone gets an influence index or a score. And so if we can find out who the top influencers are based on their index score and how many people follow them and how active they are also on Facebook and likes and things to that nature as well. So to the next level, but that's really what I'm curious about. Does influence need at least, I presume it should lead directly to a business outcome. If so, how do you know? A lot of times what, what companies might try to do is, is to engage with some of these influencers. Um, and then what also they'll do is, is they like to look at uh, people who tweet or Facebook posts that have links to have a link in their, in their tweet or a link in their post and so that they can measure who's actually looking at this based on the number of website visits they get. So tag, basically tagging. Chris, can you uh, give us uh, any success stories from any of your clients or something that's you know, made a difference in uh, what you learned or what you learned? Sure. Um, I think you see it quite a lot um, everywhere. Uh, that you look on nowadays, you'll see companies uh, using Facebook and using Twitter as a, a, prime, a prime medium to get uh, people to, you know, you'll see at harrycallis.com or um, Nike had a, has a big success story lately with some of their promotions online as well. And so um, one of the ones that I think comes to mind for me is a company, a, a home security company, um, local. And there's another home security company, ADT, which is also local, which is very big. Um, what we were able to do for this company was to compare those two, right? You have publicly available data out there. And we can grab the information about ADT. We can grab the information about LifeShield. And what we find out, found out was that um, for this one specific company, um, 
actually for both, they were not utilizing social media at all. So ADT was killing it on every other medium that there was. The TV, um, uh, direct mail was a big one, um, but they had no social presence. And so it gave the smaller company, compared to this giant ADT, it gave the smaller company um, an area where they could steal share voice. And they could actually make their, their, themselves known. And because this is the new wave of marketing analytics, it gets them in front of a company like ADT before they're even, they even know what hit them. And before they know it, you know, th their share of voice starts to shrink and another company starts to become a, a real competitor uh, because they're no longer um, hawking the, the product, they're actually using the new wave of analytics. And so that was, a, I think, a real good su success story. Millennials. You don't know that term? No. Neither did I. Um, are kind of ignoring the traditional forms of media. So is there any fear that once all these companies start taking advantage of social media sites, especially Facebook and Twitter, we may just view that as kind of spamming and ignore it altogether? I mean, you mentioned a couple, or you mentioned a success story, and I'm sure like when just one company in an industry or a few companies are taking advantage of it, it might work. Mm -hmm. When it's every page, it's like social media sites are kind of viewed as more like what they are, social media, mm -hmm. not like a way to view advertisements. I think what you're, what you're hitting on is a good point. I actually was thinking about this um, a lot lately. Is, is I feel like marketing may be cyclical in that traditional marketing worked, or now it's not working as well, and so things are shifting into the social world. That might work, but it may not work forever, right? So then that might start to be, become looked at like, oh, geez, and so something else might come in. Maybe traditional marketing has a, has a bigger boost, but I think the goal of, of today, right now, and the future of, of social media is to figure that out, to figure out what works best, to not bombard people with ads on Facebook or ads on Twitter, and to figure out as a, as a brand, and as I said before, I don't think cons uh, bombarding consumers with ads is going to work. What they want to do is find you, so you need to make your company findable. You need to have content. You need to blog. You need to talk about your product and talk about success stories and, and also um, you know, engage the customer and, and, and make them feel like they're part of something. And when you do that, you'll, you'll see that uh, customer satisfaction ratings go up and, and, and loyalty also goes up as well. But good point. Yeah. Yeah, Chris, that's a, a great point because survey after survey, in fact, it age this week has surveys where you talk about how consumers find ads their level of annoyance is much higher for social media sites than it is for traditional media. But the key is what you said, which is, are you telling a story with your brand? So I don't think this information is so much, okay, let's put ads on Facebook, mm -hmm. but can we tell stories? Can we engage the consumer? And importantly, can we engage the consumer with more than one sense? In other words, instead of just video, can we do video and sound, et cetera? Exactly, right. And in, uh, that's why I think YouTube might be a really good uh, avenue as well. And so a lot of times you, you have, uh, to your point, a lot of times companies may have issues clearing TV ads. That's, there's a term called clearance. And so uh, big companies like Nike or Pepsi or Doritos have no problem, right? Uh, but other companies do. And there is no clearance on YouTube. You can put you can have your own YouTube channel uh, airing any commercial that you want. No censorship. You know, obviously you're not going to want to oust anybody with weird ads, but you can go on YouTube and create your own channel and have and commercials that way. So there's, there's many opportunities that, and it, maybe not a commercial, but maybe a success, a success story, you know, something like that. One quick one, just think about GoDaddy. When they do their Super Bowl commercial, they see the uncut version exactly. available on YouTube. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I know you had a question. So when you're talking about the forums that you're referring to, and companies having a voice in those forms, those are really authentic places where customers really say what they feel. And exactly. If you're a company, you're going to take away that authenticity right. because you're promoting a product, which then creates a, an area of mistrust, I feel, for consumers. So how do you... So you're how saying... Do you do that, how do you do that in, authentic, in an authentic way if, without... If the company the bards, integrity, bombards yeah, the forum... The, the integrity of what's already existing. Well, you don't do it as... I am Nutrisystem. Here I am. Listen to me. You don't come in there and, and just you guide, all right. And you, you have um, you have people use their own Twitter handles and their own Facebook names or whatever to go into the forum. No, it's not because what happens on the boards is, is obviously you talk about. Um, you're not there to 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 lead the conversation. You're there to listen. You're there to guide. And you're there to inform. You're not there to 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 be. I am big consumer. Buy from me, um, and that's the problem that I think companies still don't understand yet. You're not there to do that. Uh, and if you are doing it, then you're doing it the wrong way. 
you need to be in there as a, as a, as a knowledge center, a knowledge base, um, and, and sort of uh, mostly engaging the customer and listening. I think listen is the key word. Um, listen to what they want, listen to what they're saying, and then take that information and use that going forward. But you don't want to take over the conversation. That, that would definitely do um, some damage to, to the forum. Yeah? You were talking about um, sentiment analysis. Uh, one of the trends that I've noticed in my research is terms, uh, swear words, slang, inappropriate language that could be a positive sentiment is being forced into this uh, negative category. What's the best way to manage that um, to, to ensure that you know, you're accurately measuring the positive influence you're having? As of right now, there are a lot of sentiment analysis or parsers or, or text mining software available um, out there. Um, nobody has nailed, nailed it. No one. No one has the software that's the software. I'm hoping to build the software. <laughs> um, and maybe it's a little ambitious. Um, but but what, you, what needs to be done is, uh, you know, NLP, natural, langu natural language processing um, needs to take place. You have to make sure that you're doing the right sort of um, um, sentence structure and parsing analysis. Um, and you have to really, what I think it takes is time. I think you need to build um, structured sort of, um, what's the word I'm looking for, data, maybe data warehouses or, or, or lists, lists of, per industry, lists of words that are positive, that are negative, that are emotional, that are not emotional, list of phrases, lists of, of double words, and, and create sort of a, a, a database, and a, a, a knowledge base, if you will, of what um, those, those phrases and sentences are for each industry. And then you can apply that when you're doing your natural language processing and your text mining. But it's, it's not there yet. Uh, how did you define viral, and how did you decide where to draw the line? Good question. Uh, that's actually for our company, proprietary information. Um, I'll tell you that it's, it's at least retweeted more than 10 times. And it depends sometimes on the company as well, because um, not a lot of companies, if, you, if you're dealing with smaller companies, um, there will not be that sort of volume of retweet or volume of viral activity. And so we sort of, it's on a, a moving scale, depending on the size of the company. Sorry. Is there any like ethical or legal way of extracting private information? So users that make their settings private? No, th that's a, right now that's a, a big issue with Facebook. Well, not issue, but it's, it's good. Privacy is good. Uh, no one's trying to invade privacy. Um, and Facebook does a good job of limiting the feeds that they, that they that will allow you to crawl. Um, and no, it's not ethical to go in and privately mine data. Uh, and it, it is not uh, usable at that point. So. Um, until their privacy is, is sort of loosen, loosened, excuse me, <clears throat> um, no, and I, uh, we won't do that. <laughs> so, as just as an ethical rule. Well, given the attitude of negatively advertising forced down you, product placement like in movies and TV, and so uh, would this social network really help them figure out which place to do product placements and even contact the tweeters themselves? See that a growing thing? Exactly. So that's a really great point. So I think. One of the things that you want to learn is what are your what are your consumers watching, what are they um, drinking, what are they listening to, music, what are they reading, all all sorts of mediums you can find out about your consumer base through social media, and then that's a tool that you can use for you know say it's Harry Potter you know I don't know what the and you, know, you can use that as a, as a tool and as a medium to go and, and and do product placement correctly, yeah I think that's great. Yeah. I'm going back to the sentence sentiment analysis piece. I mean, you divide it into positive and negative, but is there a third sort of neutral category, and how, how do you handle that? We have five categories. So there's extremely positive, positive, neutral, negative, extremely negative. Um, and again, not many software companies out there right now will split it into five categories, and we're sort of trying to pioneer that as well. Can we find very emotional um, sound bites and can we place them into a very emotional strong bucket a very emotional negative bucket and and, and the in betweens as well so net so ones that are neutral really are like what i was saying earlier when you see something that says uh, villanova is playing tonight on espn is that positive or is that negative it's nothing it's really nothing you want to get as much emotional chatter out there as you can you want people to be talking about you in a positive or negative but you want to be talked about uh, most of the times when it's neutral it's some ad company or some um, television station that is just, you know, it's a brand advertisement basically. So then I 
guess the, the you're saying maybe maximizing your or increasing your neutral is not necessarily a good thing. Exactly. To kind of go back to the basketball example, I imagine that Villanova basketball though gets a lot more neutral mentions than Haverford basketball does, for instance. Yes. So is that is that some way indicative of, of reach or importance? It sure is. Um, I think and you'll see UConn has a ton of neutral mentions as well uh, because a lot, a lot of people are, are talking about you know the games on tonight um, but I think what you really want to do is that's a, a, a key metric to look at is, is what's being talked about but I like to separate the two and talk about so there's there's the the neutral emotionless chatter which has its meaning and has its KPIs around it but then there's also the emotional chatter which people that actually are talking about something specific to whatever you're searching and giving you information either on the positive or on the negative side. And that's really where you have, I, I like to dig down and, and get some more information. But, but reach is definitely um, a metric that you want to take, take a look at. Yeah? Uh, you mentioned uh, identified followers that are really being ambassadors for mm -hmm. At any point, can you reach out to them to have any communication, like appreciation? Yeah, you can, but you need to be careful. Um, because you, you, you could very well turn a, a positive influence or influencer into someone that doesn't want to talk about or be around your brand anymore. You want to let them do their thing. <laughs> you know, you don't want to really mess with a good thing. Um, it's possible, but it need, there needs to be some strategy around it. You talked at the beginning about the unstructured nature of social media. Mm -hmm. Are there any concerns within the industry over time that as companies develop structure for social media data that it loses its value? Um, no, I don't. I don't see a, a. I don't see any value lost in structured data, um, taking unstructured to structured. I, I think the better we can get at it, the more we can learn from it. Um, there may be uh, situations where we can't structure to the best of our ability, um, but I don't see a downside in structuring the social media data. So essentially, the unstructured nature of it right now is a, is a good thing. It's not so. It's, it's a good thing for me because no one knows how to structure it. <laughs> So, and, I, and I'm trying to do my best at it. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a concern right now for, for companies because they don't know how to, to use it. Like I said, you can read a review, but you can't read a thousand. Um, and so uh, companies need a way to get structured data in-house uh, so that they, they can integrate it. Um, and I think it's important to do. Yes, yes. I think that there needs to be social media dedicated department. Um, is, that, is that what you're asking? Well, like the, just the type of person. Like, would the person, I mean, I, I just feel like a lot of people try and force it, and, you know, those blog posts come off pretty obvious. Mm -hmm. um, and then there are the people who are authentic and really relate to them. Uh, go ahead. No. I uh, agree, and I think that's why the millennials. <laughs> Have, a, have an upper hand here uh, because they're born into it. But we're, we've been born into social media um, and so we know how to interact on it and we know um, how to use it, I think, properly. But do you think that those, those same people could still communicate to um, you know, their own, like they're just marketing the wrong thing, I guess, to say? Like if the same person was interested in what they were doing, would they be a better fit or? I'm still lost. In yeah. of the brand. Yeah. So what's really what we're finding is that it's really important at the company um, I oversee is that A, we have a social media dedicated team. We have a team that works on it and we take a look at all of the different integrated sites, including Pinterest at this point, which is one of the largest growing on social media. The other thing is to ensure that those people have the voice of the brand in mind over mm -hmm. and over again. Because if you start bringing in a voice um, that is um, not aligned to the brand, They'll, they'll catch you. Yep. So you have to have a team that understands yeah. the One of one of the things that we call IMC, isn't it? I'm sorry. It's IMC. When you put it into marketing speak, it's how do you make that a part of integrated marketing communication? Absolutely. One of the imp implementation processes that we do, we call it, is is actually called One Voice, and so that's a good point. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry that I misread. Thanks for the save there. Mm -hmm. But yeah, One Voice I think is 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 very important, and you have to make sure that you're interested and aligned with the brand before you can actually partake in social media. Yeah. 
How do you incorporate transaction data into your social media analytics? Links are a good way to do that. Um, if you have a link, you can obviously track that. Uh, but you can you can do a, a, um, multiple correlative analysis to look at uh, social media spikes in certain areas and ads that that peaked. If you can cor correlate the ad to the social media buzz to the increase in sales, you got a good thing there. But I think traceable media, you have to have some sort of way to trace it, whether it be um, a phrase that you put in a social media post and then they have to put it in the box to get the coupon or whatever it may be. Figuring out ways to make it traceable is, is an important um, strategy that, that companies are going to need to, to look at. Uh, when you do like the text mining, mm -hmm. you're taking all those words, do you compare them to like an event so you know like what's sarcasm and what's like actually like good? Like, they're like great jobs, they don't know what they thought. <laughs> it comes up as like great jobs. That's a good point. Um, that's, that's tough. Um, that's the next level, I think, of text mining. Sarcasm. Um, <laughs> right? I mean, how do, you, uh, how do you do that? And so that's a, good, that's a really good point, and I think that's something that uh, I'll have to take into consideration. As of right now, no. It would be great job, positive Villanova, good job, you know. But comparing it against an event like you got blown out 85 to 40, I have to look into how to do that. Sarcasm, great. One last question. I always felt we needed a sarcasm or a comedy response. Yeah, right. That's a good point. Go ahead. Uh, how do you feel that Google's recent integration of data collection among all of its applications will influence this new wave of social media? All right, one more time. Like, Google's obviously a major player of mm -hmm. social media and like advertisement, and they recently integrated their user data collection among all of their applications. How do you feel, and it was released in their privacy policy, how do you feel that this will influence the new wave of social media analytics that we spoke about? Integration into, into Google? Yeah, they kind of integrated all of their data collection for individual users across all their platforms, like Gmail, YouTube. Yep. I think that it, that would tell us a lot, actually. I think that it's going to open up some avenues as to, to the, the relationships between some of the applications, right? So you can see um, people that are, are, are in this application are also in this application. You can start to cluster and group them more effectively. Um, there are privacy issues again with that. You know, Google, I guess, has skirted around them somehow to aggregate everything together. But once everything is aggregated, that that saves a lot of time on me, on, on people that are actually trying to mine the data because it's all there. As long as you can structure it in a way that you're able to mine it, I think it's important to to understand the relationships between the applications. So you would say it's good for your industry to spite privacy concerns? <laughs> yes. No, I, I, I do not. Uh, listen, privacy is, is something that's out there now that you know, everybody's talking about you know, SOPA and PIPA and all those things, but. Um, a lot of the stuff that's out there is public, and people know it's public, and they're not posting it to, to keep it private. They want it to be public. Uh, and so there are things you can do up front to protect yourself, and you should do those things. Um, but once it's a fair game in the public space, it's going to be used, if not by me, by somebody. And so I think uh, I'm proponent for good. You know, I'm trying to do good things with it, um, but there are definitely people that are there to do bad things with it, and that's something that we need to, to keep in mind as well when we're posting anything. I, I think privacy is a good thing, by the way. And, is that uh, it? I really want to appreciate this. I mean, Chris, you did a fantastic job. Thanks. Thank you very Thanks much. for coming. And thank you all for coming.